the things that deal with the Holy Spirit uh, are not dispensed with. And we're, we're seeing sort of, a, um, uh, sort of a negative trend among churches that at one time embraced the infilling of the Holy Spirit, uh, embraced uh, the gifts of the Spirit, healing, embraced uh, people speaking with tongues, and all of that, we see a, a, a mass exodus away from that. And so we're wanting to make sure that we, as a body of believers, don't move in the same direction as that, but that we continue to uh, stir up the things of God and stir up the gifts of the Spirit. So we're just, first of all, I, I, the Lord taught me a long time ago, teach in the direction that you need to go. Teach in the direction that you need to go. In other words, God can't water what you don't sow. You've got to sow seed in a certain direction. But this is not just about teaching. This is also about activating, okay? Activating, uh, uh, activating you in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and how you can flow in them. Not just here in church. It would include that. But it also just in life, in prayer. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pastor Ray and I were just talking today uh, during the afternoon about the, the five, you, you have, not only do you have five physical senses, but you have five spiritual senses, supernatural senses, okay? And uh, they're the sense of smell, a sense of hearing, sense of sight, sense of touch, and uh, sense of taste. You can see things supernaturally. You're a spirit. You're not just a body. You, ha you are a, a, an eternal spirit being living inside a body. And so you have t two sets of eyes. You have physical eyes. You have eyes of your heart. And uh, it's not as hard as it sounds. Once you start to sort of get familiar with how the Holy Spirit moves and operates, uh, you'll find that those spiritual senses will help you to help others. For example, uh, even the sense of smell... There, there is a supernatural ability, and I'm just pulling this out. When we talk on discerning of spirits, I'll go more in detail about it. But uh, you have the sense of, of ability to smell things supernaturally as the Holy Spirit opens up your, your sense of smell. For example, uh, cancer is very often is a spirit. It's an evil spirit. Cancer is very often, it's very often an evil spirit that has to be cast out, dealt with. Not always, but often. And if the Holy Spirit opens up your sense of smell, a cancer demon stinks. Yeah. Smells horrible. Yeah. Smells like sewage. All right? It has a sewage, a rotten smell. And uh, there are men and women in the body of Christ that their number one sense that the Holy Spirit has opened up for them is the sense of smell. All right? There's a pastor down in North Carolina who uh, when his, the Holy Spirit opens up his spiritual sense of smell, if he smells mint, he knows that is the gifts of healings in operation. And so he discerns the, 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 the manifestation of the gifts of healing. God wants to heal a bunch of people. He smells that supernaturally. And uh, that same minister, if he smells musk, like a musky smell, that's not the healing, that's miracles, like body parts growing out like eyeballs growing into sockets and, and things of that nature. So when he has a sense of a musk smell, uh, he understands he's discerning one of, the, one of the flows of the Holy Spirit. See, we are a supernatural people. And we have supernatural senses, right? I want to show you a passage of Scripture. Um, look with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to start right here. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is not automatic. The Holy Spirit is always on. He's always wanting to manifest Himself. The, but we have something to do with whether He does manifest or not. It, we, there's things that we can do that He won't manifest because He will never force Himself. And there are some things you can do individually and we can do as a group of believers that creates an environment for Him to manifest Himself. All right? And the number one thing that causes the Holy Spirit to manifest Himself is simply expectation. It's just expecting Him to. And when I say expectation, I also mean desire, that you desire that. You know, some people, when they gather in church, 
They don't desire to see the Holy Spirit in manifestation because they don't even know he's supposed to manifest himself. So they come to church, and, and it's good, and they gather, and they sing their songs and pay their tithes and hear a good message about how to live well, and that's all good. And they go home and think that that's the sum total of what God wanted to do. But the Lord, the Holy Spirit, wants to manifest himself supernaturally to help people supernaturally. And not just, not just in our gatherings, but in our daily walk, we should be expecting the gifts of the Spirit to be in constant manifestation, constant operation every day. And it's not up to the Holy Spirit. It's up to you to make that happen. The Holy Spirit's always on. He's waiting for us to be activated and to plug in. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Do you know you can prophesy at will? The Bible says you can speak with tongues once you're filled with the Holy Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit, which is different than being born again. When you receive the Holy Spirit, He'll inspire you to, to speak in a supernatural prayer language, uh, but He won't make you do it. He'll prompt you, but you have, to, you have to open your mouth. You have to make the sounds and trust Him to give you the words. All right? And now, now that I'm filled or you're filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? I can pray in tongues as much as or as little as I want to. But did you know the same thing's true of prophecy? You can prophesy as little or as much as you want to. What is prophecy? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that by saying tongues is supernatural speech given to you by God in a language you don't understand. It's, it's, it could be understood by someone else, but the one speaking it, it's something their mind doesn't understand. It's supernatural speech in a tongue you don't understand. That's tongues. Prophecy is supernatural speech in the language you do understand, but it's not coming out of your head. It's coming out of your spirit. And you can prophesy at will. A lot of us have some old Pentecostal um, traditions that we can't do it unless God moves on us. That's old school Pentecost. All right? That's not true. When the Holy Spirit gifts you with things, there are things you can do to activate those things. There are things you can do to, to, to activate it. And what happens is if we think we have to wait until the Holy Spirit moves on us, sometimes we won't even respond for years at a time. But we can step out into these things because when a gift is given, it's given for you to use as you want. Now, you can use or, misuse, use or misuse a gift, and that's why he gave us the Bible, to show us the proper use of it, the proper use of those things. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, 1 Corinthians, the whole chapter is the main chapter about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But verse 1, uh, the Apostle Paul, and, and I like to say that it's the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, says now... Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, you'll notice, first of all, in this, uh, the first of all, the first thing that the Holy Spirit says is, I don't want you as a Christian to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. Don't be ignorant. Right. Well, now, why did the Holy Spirit say that? Because apparently there was a lot of ignorance in the church of Corinth and probably in all the churches a lot of ignorance about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say this with as much po positive kindness as I can. There is even more ignorance about the gifts of the Spirit now than there was then. And the ignorance is getting, is getting stronger and stronger. Okay? There are churches and pastors that once embraced the Holy Spirit that allowed the Holy Spirit to move on Sunday morning, they absolutely have banished the Holy Spirit from their Sunday morning services because they don't want to offend the new people. All right? All right? And, and the way that some Spirit-filled people manifest the Holy Spirit, it would offend new people because they're, they're abusing the gifts of the Spirit. But the answer is not cut them out entirely, but it's to properly teach and to properly pastor and, to, and make corrections and get them flowing in a way that God wants them. But it's not either or. It's find out how to do it properly. Amen. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like Brother Hagen, Dad Hagen, who was my spiritual 
a mentor, he said, I would rather have a little wildfire and excess than to have the order of a graveyard and no, mani- no fire and no manifestation at all. Amen. And then he, goes on, he would go on to say, there's plenty of wet blankets to put out any of the wildfires. Amen. Right? So we're just um, stirring, like Peter said, I want to stir you up by, by way of remembrance. Stir you up by reminding you. And this is not just to sit and be taught. This is also at the end, times of activating. So you need to kind of get your antennas up, right? Because I expect manifestation to happen, and and it's going to be awesome. It's not hard. It's not hard at all. But first of all, we're not to be ignorant of the Holy Spirit, not to be ignorant of the gifts of the Spirit. But if you'll notice in your Bible, the word gifts is italicized. Y'all see that? The reason that gifts is italicized is because in the original Greek language, that word's not in there. So literally how it would read is, now concerning spirituals, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And I think the Amplified Bible really, uh, the Amplified Bible puts it in the best uh, phrase. It's um, uh, things pertaining to and of the Holy Spirit. He said, brothers, concerning things pertaining to and of the Holy Spirit, I don't want you to be ignorant. So if there's ignorance about things pertaining to the Holy Spirit, then there's ignorance about things pertaining to the Holy Spirit now. And we don't want to be ignorant about it. We want to pursue it and press into it. Amen? Amen. Now, notice also uh, chapter, same chapter, the very last verse, verse 31. And we'll eventually break all this down. You know, can't do it all in one night. But if you're hungry enough to get it, we'll, we'll get it to you. Notice what he says again, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Earnestly desire. Earnestly desire. What in, what in the world does it mean to earnestly desire? If you look up the word desire in the original language, it's the word zealous. It's zelates. It literally means, it, it means boiling to the boiling point. You, you're, he, here's what God is saying to us. I want your desire for the manifestations of the Holy Spirit to be at a boiling point. We want to be boiling with desire. Wow, that's pretty intense. Don't you think that's pretty intense? We want to be boiling with desire for the best gifts. Somebody says, well, what are the best gifts? Well, I don't know except to say this. Whichever gift of the Spirit is needed right now is the best one. If it's gifts of healings, that's the one we need to be boiling for. If it's working of miracles, that's the one we need to be boiling for. Right? And then notice chapter 14 and verse 1. Chapter 14 and verse 1. Pursue love, the love of God. Pursue God's love. In other words, make make God's love, your understanding of His love for you, right? His love is first love. Making His love first love. Pursue love, walking in love towards others. and, And desire spirituals, things pertaining to the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So now the Holy Spirit takes up another level and says, I want you to pursue love. Don't try to do gifts of the Spirit for your own self-improvement, your own self-exaltation. We want to do all of these things, these gifts of the Spirit. We want to do them with the motive of love. We want these not for us to show how spiritual we are, but because it's God's way of helping hurting people. We want to manifest the gifts of the Spirit through the motive of the love of God. And if you do pursue love, love will cause you to boil for the hunger to meet needs supernaturally through the gifts of the Spirit. In other words, you can't divorce gifts of the Spirit from the love of God. If you really love people, you're going to want to desire the gifts of the Spirit because those nine gifts of the Spirit are how God's going to flow through us to meet people's needs. The Bible doesn't divorce the love of God from the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Love creates a desire for you to have and operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen? But but then he pulls one of the nine out and he says, uh, Be boiling for the gifts, but especially, especially that you may prophesy. So this, out of these nine gifts that we're going to look at, God says in this verse, Desiring to speak supernaturally by the gift of prophecy, to prophesy to people, is something you should 
desire above all of them, especially that one. Now, that puzzled me for a long time. Why, with all these other nine gifts, and we're going to show you what they are, why, Holy Spirit, do you want us to covet, especially to prophesy? And I think I have an answer. You, I can't prove it to be right, and you, but you can't prove it's wrong. Okay? So I'm going to call it a Byronism. <laughs> okay? All right? I'm not going to say it's a thus saith the Lord. Here's what I believe the Lord showed me. Take it or leave it. Everything begins by speaking. So if you're able to speak supernaturally by the gift of prophecy, that creates sight, the revelation gifts. And when the revelation gifts are in operation, that creates power, the power gifts. Sound, sight, manifestation. Watch this in Genesis 1. God said, let there be light, right? And there was light, sight. And God saw that it was good, manifestation. Speaking, seeing, manifesting. So if a church can learn to flow properly in the utterance gifts, I believe that the, the gift of prophecy is the trigger to the other eight gifts of the Spirit. So you pray much in tongues in your personal time. All right, my goal, now I'm just sharing with you personally, my goal is to pray in my prayer language and talk to the Father out of my spirit at least uh, two hours a day. And I've actually put myself on a timer to make sure I'm doing that. Okay, I have a timer on my cell phone, I hit go, and I pray. If a phone call comes or I've got to eat or I've got to do something, I'll stop it, and it, it accumulates minutes. Now, you may not have to do that, but I don't want to think I did it, but I didn't. Right. Amen? Yeah. Because there's a place I'm going with this. And what I have found out is as I have redeveloped the habit of praying much in tongues, my personal prayer language, praying much in tongues, I have found you get over into about the one hour mark and there's a flow that begins to happen. 40 minutes, 45 minutes to about an hour, there's a flow. And then that flow just keeps happening and happening. And then the two hour mark comes. And uh, about a week ago, I prayed for about six hours, six and a half hours in the Holy Spirit. And it was not hard. It, it, it became a flow. And what I've noticed is as the more I've prayed in the Holy Spirit, the more I've been helping people supernaturally. Saying things that were very accurate that I had no clue was accurate. All right, that, that all came from praying much in the Spirit, which then leads to prophecy, speaking supernaturally with your known tongue, which helps people supernaturally. Now, let's, let's pray a prayer. I, I'm going to lead you in a prayer uh, of uh, affirming and you setting your desire. We're going to pray out verse 1. Are you ready to do that? Here's what I'm going to have you to pray. Now, if you don't agree with it, don't do it. But I'm going to have you, we're going to pray this out loud here in a second. Here, I'm going to tell you what it is, then we'll do it. We're going to affirm before the Father and out of our own heart that we're pursuing the love of God. And out of that, we're going to pray, not only are we pursuing the, the love walk, but we're also going to pursue and boil for the gifts of the Spirit to be in operation. And especially, we're going to set our intention on pursuing the ability, you prophesying. Amen? Amen. So let's pray that. He out loud with me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, make the decision, I make the decision, a heart decision. A heart decision. I, set I set my intention to pursue love. And to boil with desire for the gifts of the Spirit, especially to prophesy. I make the decision right now that I will prophesy and develop a life of prophesying in Jesus' name. Thank you for it, Father. Now, let's lift your hand and thank God for it. Hallelujah. We thank you for this gift. We thank you for this gift. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So now, uh, before we dig further into this, I want you to go over to chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 8. You're there in 13 or 14. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, and then we're going to bounce right back to 14 again. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. All right? Chapter 2, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. 
We want to make sure that we don't think we know so much that we don't need to hear anything else. Here's what God just said. If you think you know anything, in other words, I know that. I don't need to hear any more. You know nothing. Because a person that knows something has found out how much he doesn't know. One of the keys to knowledge is that you find out you're not as smart as you were 20 years ago. And, and you've heard men of God in their later years say, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. So one of the keys to wisdom is understanding not what you know, but respecting what you don't know. So that you always stay humble and hungry. The minute you lose your hungry, hunger to grow in your knowledge of the Word, to grow in your knowledge of God, to grow in your knowledge of, of all of this, the minute you lose your interest in learning and growing, you know nothing. Amen. Amen. So, but notice what he says. That wasn't the main point. Notice the last phrase. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. So it doesn't matter how much Bible knowledge you have, how much theology you know, how many seminaries, cemeteries you've been to. It doesn't matter how much you know. Just knowledge itself will puff you up and you become like a, a popcorn Christian. Just big, puffy, but no weight or no substance. Just, you just know. But when you begin to, through the love of God, take what you know to build people up, to edify people, to lift people, now you're walking in a power of God. Love is always interested in edifying. Every church service, you should be interested in building somebody up. Every, everything we do should be interested in building the body of Christ, building people up. Amen. Every song we sing up here, it's not about showing me, showing you how, how awesome I am. Every sermon I preach shouldn't be trying to demonstrate my knowledge. It ought to be using all I have within me to build you up. Praise God. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 14. Are you following me? So now you understand why he wants you to, uh, you'll see in a minute, why does he want you to really boil over for the ability to speak supernaturally, prophetically? Here, verse 2 will tell you. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no man understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, I want you to see something before we go to the, to the next verse. The first purpose of praying in tongues is not a message to men, but a, a prayer language to God. That's where we get prayer language from. Notice what it says. He who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. In other words, the first purpose of tongues is a devotional gift of talking to God. It's a prayer language. That's the first purpose. Amen. Now, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll look at this pattern. Everybody, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, receives their prayer language. Some yield to it that day and speak it, and some take a day or two and <laughs> struggle with it, depending on your background. You could speak and yield to the, that, that prayer language the day you receive the Holy Spirit. But the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in your prayer tongue, supernaturally to God in your prayer language. Amen. Now, tongues in and of itself, as we'll get into it later, has more than one use. Its first use is a devotional gift, privately, alone with God. Right. Its second use is giving a message in tongues to another person or group of people. And now that tongue has to be interpreted, or what's the benefit of you saying that to people? There's no point in saying it to somebody because they don't know what you're saying. So when you're used, when, when the Holy Spirit inspires you to give a message in tongues, it would need to be interpreted or no one benefits from it. Right. But when I'm praying alone to God and I'm in my car, I'm in my office, I'm alone, I don't interpret all that. I just talk to the Father. He doesn't need an interpretation. He knows perfectly what I'm saying and the devil knows perfectly what I'm not saying. He has no clue. He can't arrest that prayer because he, he doesn't know what I'm saying. I'll tell you something else about praying in tongues. You can't doubt it. 
It's impossible to doubt prayer when you're praying in tongues. So you're, when you pray in tongues, you're praying with a perfect faith, which means it will come to pass unhindered. You can't doubt that. You can't doubt. When you're praying in tongues, you can't doubt it because you don't know what you said. Amen. The devil can't stop it because he doesn't know what you said. So he's going to get a sneak up whammy sometime in the future because you prayed something out that's going to destroy something that he's trying to use against you. But it's a, it's a blind punch because he doesn't know what you said. And when it comes to pass, he can't see it coming because he never heard you pray it. Praise God. We need to do some more sneak up attacks on the enemy. Praise God. Amen. So, and then there are other people with regard to tongues. That's their ministry. The third use is there are people that are in the ministry of tongues and interpretation. All right? I mean, and there's some pretty awesome people that can read your mail. And usually it's a husband and wife team a lot of times where either the wife or the husband will give a tongue as a ministry, will give a tongue, the other person will interpret it, and the interpretation has such revelation in it that it, it reveals things about them that they didn't tell anyone to where they know that's God talking. And it's like what I call it reads their mail. Not to expose them, but to bless them. And we need that office. We need the office of tongues and interpretation restored back to the church, especially this one. Because I don't pastor other ones. Because we, the love of God causes us, we want to help people, right? Amen. Now, so, now, so say this out loud. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. Now, notice verse 3. Notice verse 3. And I'll say this one more thing about the second verse because this really helped me when I was, I was taught against praying in tongues. Now, it wasn't on purpose. My family just didn't know any better. And uh, they were taught by their, their, you know, their generations that tongues was wrong and, and all that. But my family, all except one, are now filled with the Holy Spirit. But when I first got filled, they thought I'd lost my mind. They thought I had joined a cult. They thought it was of the devil. But it wasn't long before they saw the fruit. And said, we want what you've got. Because you've got something we don't have. I said, oh, yes, I do. But it's, it's a gift, so you can have him too. And they received, right? Uh, so, but one of the things is I couldn't get my, my head around tongues, you know, because I knew when I, re when I received the Holy Spirit, I would begin to speak with tongues. And the thing that messed me up the most is I thought the Holy Spirit would just talk through me without me doing anything. Like a radio. I, I just kept waiting for him to say something and me not have anything to do with it. And then I thought, well, he'll make me talk in tongues, and it'll just become so powerful. He'll just make my mouth talk like I'm vomiting or something. And, and that never happened, and it finally dawned on me. After about eight months to a year, the Holy Spirit says, I will never force you to do anything. I'm a gentleman. He goes, I'll inspire you, but you are in control of it. Man, when I learned that, I, I, that's when I received the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, but here's what I want you to see. Uh, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. And no one includes the one doing the speaking. That's what helped me, is no one includes the... Because people said, well, now, yet that's, people said, that's dumb. I mean, why would God want you to pray something you don't understand? Well, I don't know, but right here, and then this helped me, because no one understands him, including the one doing the praying. Amen. And the biggest fight that I had with receiving the Holy Spirit is my mind wanted to be in control of everything I said. My mind wanted to be king. My logic, my reasoning, my thinking, the way I thought, my opinion. I was not letting anything come out of my mouth if I didn't understand it. But the day I finally let go of having to understand everything coming out of my mouth is the day that my spirit was liberated just to bypass my brain and just pray out of my belly. Praise God. Oh, what a day of liberation. What a day of And thank God even now I'm so glad I can pray in the spirit when my mind is in total confusion. Yeah, not that I, I don't live in total confusion, but when my mind doesn't know. I don't have to wait till I know how to pray. I can start praying in tongues and thank God the Holy Spirit will help me to pray things out when my mind's going, I don't know what to do. But my spirit with the Holy Spirit in me, he knows what to do. So I start praying perfect prayers that bypass an imperfect understanding. That's awesome, man. How many of y'all go to, how many of y'all is that your go-to to pray in the spirit? 
You know, tomorrow's a mystery. You better be praying out tomorrow today. Amen. I like, it th- I like to say it this way. You got to pray it before you play it. You got to pray it out before it plays out. Pray it out before you play it out. Right? In other words, I see praying in the Spirit as paving a road that your life's about to drive on. Poor praying is poor driving. If you have spotty prayers, you're going to have a pothole road. If you have just limited prayers, you're going to have a dirt road. Why don't you just go ahead and pray much in the Holy Ghost and pave yourself a superhighway to do what God calls you to do. Amen? Now, love edifies, verse 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification. That's love then, isn't it? He who prophesies, you're speaking supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. He speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. How many of you guys believe that people need to be built up and edified? How many of you believe they need to be exhorted and encouraged? How many of you believe they need to be comforted? That's the three purposes of prophecy. Now, a lot of people think that prophesying or the gift of prophecy is predicting the future. That's the wrong gift. That's another gift. That's the gift of the word of wisdom. Prophecy, when you prophesy, it just means inspired speech. And the number one purpose of prophecy is simply to edify, exhort, and comfort. It doesn't have future revelation in it. It's an encouragement from the Holy Spirit that comes out of you and is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And honestly, we need to be prophesying and be prophesied to all of the time because we need edified, exhorted, and comforted all the time. Now, if you grew up in old school Pentecost, we think that, you know, prophesying, you have to kind of go into like a a trance, (laughs) you know, and, and then you have to say, thus saith the Lord. Well, no, you don't have to say that. And God doesn't speak in Elizabethan English either. King James, all right? Very often a prophetic word is just you inspired to say something you didn't know you were going to say. And that lines up with the word. It just comes up out of you. And, and, and you say it, you speak this word, it's a prophetic word. And it just, it ministers something out of your belly. It's encouragement. And you'll find yourself in, if you'll just step out and begin to encourage somebody on the phone, or encourage them when you're around them, and check down in here, not even that you have to even hard check it, just be ready for the Holy Spirit to inspire you to say some things you didn't know you were going to say. It doesn't have to be profound. Amen. Praise God. Uh, The other day, uh, I I was uh, doing something, and I just had an urge, urge is not even the right word, the thought, to call somebody. And, you know, I'm learning to listen to that more and more. And so I, I thought, okay, I'll, uh, I'll call them. So I called them up and said some things. And then I just felt in my heart I wanted to say a couple things to them. Just they had an urge in my heart to say a couple of things to them. And I said those things. To me, they were no big deal. To that person, it turned their world around. They said, man, oh, man, I'm, I, need, I was just asking the Lord about that. I was just, man, I'm so glad you called. How did you know? How did you know I needed a phone call? I said, I didn't know that. I just had, the thought came, the thought came, amen. See, that's what I mean. It's not always spectacular to you, but it is to that person, and it's supernatural. We need to be constantly prophesying to each other, amen? Now, notice he goes on to say, but he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, loves himself. Tongues is you allowing God to love you because love edifies. So when you're speaking in tongues, you're edifying yourself, but he who prophesies He edifies the church, builds up the church. Well, I like to say this. If you're not edified, you're probably not going to edify anybody else. So we need to pray much in tongues so our battery's charged. Edify means to build up or to charge up like a battery. So when I'm in my personal time, you know, and I'm doing, you know what I'm doing? I'm edifying. I'm charging my battery, praise God. Why? Because I want to have a full charge so I can edify others and build others up and charge others up. Praise God. Amen. Praying in tongues equips you to minister to your family. It, 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 it builds you up so that you're not just... You're not just yielding to your emotions all the time and yielding to your flesh. Uh, it, the more you pray in tongues, the less selfish you'll be because you're keeping yourself in the flow of God's love. One of the best ways to keep your emotions and your flesh in check is to make your tongue talk in tongues. 
Because what you're doing then is you're submitting yourself to the Spirit of God. So that when offensive things and offensive people come, you're already hooked up with the spirit of love and not with your selfish flesh. Hallelujah. It's best to already be hooked up with the spirit of God when those things come and they will come. Jesus said offenses will come. Amen. Praise God. And and so then he says in verse uh, verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Now, he's talking about in a public meeting, all right? Unless, indeed, he interprets that the church may receive edification. Now, notice this. He says, greater is he that prophesies in a church meeting than he who speaks with tongues in a church meeting unless, indeed, he interprets. Now, do you see what he just said? It's possible for the one who is speaking with tongues in a public meeting to interpret his own tongue. Because he said, unless he or she interprets. There are some churches that say you cannot give a tongue in a meeting unless there's other people to interpret. But they just don't read the Bible. He said, greater is he that prophesies than he who speaks with a tongue unless he, the one that was speaking with tongues, interprets. Now, I personally believe, personally, it's better, I think, to have two, one giving a tongue and the other giving the the interpretation. I think that's ideal, but that's not required. Here, you can interpret your own tongue. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense? So if we're moving, if you see us demonstrating this as pastors or whatever, and you see maybe, maybe I give a tongue out, and then I turn around and interpret it, I'm perfectly in line with the Word of God. Right? Uh, Very often, though, I'll wait. I'll I'll give it a period of time when a tongue is given. I will give a period of time for it to be interpreted, usually about 15 to 30 seconds, because if you're not that, you gotta, you got to have enough courage. you got to get rid of your pride. The reason some of you aren't interpreting is because you're protecting yourself. You fear failure. And you don't need to be fearing failure around family. Right? So don't be afraid to step out into some of these areas and let the Holy Spirit hone you up some and, and, and tune you up some and let you flow and move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It could be life and death for people. Amen. So anyway, you can interpret your own. But he says, I wish you all did. So based on verse 5, in one sense of the word, tongues with interpretation is equal to prophecy. Amen. And the whole purpose of it is he's saying edification. If all you're going to do is speak in tongues during the whole service, no one's going to get edified. Well, if you'll interpret it, then people get in on what's being said, and they get edified. It's just about the love of God, really. Verse 6, But now, brethren, or brothers, if I come to you speaking with tongues, or praying in tongues, right, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, we'll we'll explain what revelation is, by knowledge, by prophesying or by teaching. There are four byproducts here, four byproducts, supernatural byproducts of praying privately in tongues. Now understand this, the Apostle Paul was a traveling preacher. He traveled from church to church. He didn't catch an airplane, didn't have them then. He rode my horseback, he walked or rode on a camel. And so if you're traveling hundreds or thousands of miles, In between churches and cities, he had days and weeks he would travel. And what he's saying is, in those days and weeks between church meetings, I was praying in the Spirit. And so he said, what good is it for me to come to your church having prayed for days and weeks in the Spirit if I don't have some kind of a byproduct to offer you to profit you? And he gives four byproducts of praying much in tongues. The first one, revelation. What is revelation? Revelation is you supernaturally seeing something by, by, God, by God that you could not have known naturally. It's supernatural insight. It's, it's, it's something being revealed. You didn't study it. it just it, It's revealed to you. It could, be a, it, could be a, it could be a truth in the Bible. All right? And if you get a revelation about the Word, always check it with eldership. And there's always going to be three or four or five or six other verses to verify your revelation. 
It could be a revelation about somebody with a disease. It could be a revelation about an issue in somebody's life. You could walk in, there's a revelation. That person over there is, has stage 4 cancer, and you're able to walk over to them and say, excuse me, I think the Lord was talking to me. Are you, or do you have any type of a problem in your body? Yes, I do. Is it cancer? Yes. Would it be stage 4? Yeah. How would you know that? Revelation. For example, revelation. And the more I pray in tongues, the more revelation I get. The second one is, uh, is knowledge. Somebody says, what's the difference between revelation and knowledge? Knowledge, it very often, is uh, you knowing not only a revelation of the Scripture or an instant revelation, but it becomes a realm of knowledge, a connection of facts that come together to give you knowledge about a situation. All right. How many of you ever had the experience of seven or eight or nine verses just snapping together? And all of a sudden they connect and you're like, whoa, I never saw that before. Okay. Or prophesying. If you pray much in tongues in private, you'll find yourself speaking supernaturally to people out of your belly. And then the last one's teaching. You'll find yourself, if you pray much in tongues, able to teach and break the truths of the word down in a way that's simple, in a way that's understandable. Everything flows out of praying in tongues. That's the genesis of everything. Amen? Praise God. So we want to do much of that praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, uh, and, and flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. So he said, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want to, uh, I want to go ahead and, and go down a couple more verses here. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? If somebody's playing a flute or a harp and they don't play a tune that you recognize... No one's going to know what you're playing. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So I guess he's saying when that trumpeter, there's a certain sound, that's a battle cry. And if that trumpeter doesn't play that sound, no one recognizes that they're supposed to go to battle. All right? He's giving examples of how we need to make sure that we're clearly communicating what the Spirit of God is saying. And then he said, So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words, Easy to understand. How will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. The problem that they had in the Corinthian church is that's all they wanted to do was speak with tongues. They came and had a tongue-talking fest. I mean, they just wanted to come and just talk in tongues the whole time they were together. And Paul is trying to bring that into order. He's saying no one even knows what you're saying. You know, make sure you're interpreting the stuff that you're saying. That's all. It was just an excess. Now, in the modern church in America, we're now saying God doesn't want tongues in the church at all. And we throw it all out. But this is not what Paul or the Lord is saying. He's just saying tongues is good, but make sure you do it right. All right? So there are, it may be so many kinds of languages in the world. None of them was without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Have you ever been in an airport and heard foreigners talking to one another? I tell you, I got offended. How dare they talk in a foreign tongue in front of me? I just changed my membership to another airport. <laughs> I didn't get offended. I just understood they were talking in a foreign language. And it, it made no sense to me whatsoever. So if we come into a meeting and all we're doing is speaking with tongues, it's the same effect. You're saying something, but we don't know what it is. And we want, God wants you in on the conversation. Now, notice what he said, verse 12. This is the meat of it now. Even so you, now this is him talking to you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification, the building up of the church that you seek to excel. He says, if you're going to desire gifts, but you do desire them, he said, make sure you're desiring them for the right purpose. The purpose is is so that the church can be edified. And notice he said, make sure you seek to excel. Become excellent at it. He's not telling you get rid of it. He's saying learn to do it with excellence. Learn to flow in the gifts with excellence. Seek to excel. Say that out loud. Seek to excel. See, God wants to use you supernaturally. He wants you to learn. We're not going to learn it all tonight. There's no way we could do that. But he wants you to become hungry in your heart uh, and in your time of prayer, say, Lord, show me how to flow with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's after. Praise God. So how do you excel? Verse 13. How do we excel? Here you go. Therefore, let him 
or her who speaks in a tongue, pray. Pray what? Pray that he or she may interpret. There we go again. So if you're in a public meeting and you're not sure if there's any interpreters around and you start speaking in a tongue in a public meeting, your next prayer needs to be, Lord, I pray, help me interpret what I just said. All right? And, what, and that's what it looks like in the next verse. For if I pray in a tongue, what prays? Spirit. Your spirit's praying, not your head. It's coming out of your belly, right? Amen. Uh, he, he said, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding, my mind, is unfruitful. Your mind doesn't get it. Well, what's the conclusion then? Verse 15. Well, here's what the conclusion is. I will pray with the spirit. And I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. It's a beautiful thing to hear somebody singing with the Spirit, singing in tongues. And I will also sing with the understanding. What's, what's the Apostle Paul saying here? Here's what he's saying. You're gonna, if you're going to pray or sing in tongues in, in a public meeting, pray for the interpretation. So what it happens is you start speaking in tongues you pray for the interpretation, then you speak in your understanding, and you speak out the interpretation. If you're going to sing in tongues, which apparently singing in tongues was a part of their gathering, not just songs on a screen. Not just songs on a screen. Right? right? Not just songs on a screen, but songs that come out of your born-again spirit, birthed by the Holy Spirit, never been sung before. He said, make sure when you sing in tongues, you pray for the interpretation and you sing the interpretation out. Man, we need this in the church. We need this in our small groups. Our children need to learn to do this. We need to know how to pray out of that innermost part of us that's born again. Amen. And notice what he says. If you don't do it this way, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit. So praying in tongues is blessing with your spirit. How will he who occupies the place of the uninformed Say amen at your giving of thanks. Notice that when you're singing in tongues, praying in tongues, you're giving thanks. Thanks to God. Since he does not understand what you say, he can't say amen to it. Verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well. Tongues is giving thanks well. Wow, that's awesome, right? Giving thanks well. No, notice this. But the other's not edified. So you're edifying yourself at the expense of everybody around you. And that's not love. Then the Apostle Paul says this. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Now there was 30 to 60,000 church members in Corinth. 30 to 60,000. And Paul said he was praying in tongues more than all of them. <laughs> that means he was doing a lot of praying in tongues. And they weren't doing very much in private. They were just showing up at church and doing it, right? He thanks God. But he says, yet in the church, when we gather in the meeting, in the church meeting, he said, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. He said, it's no good for me to come and just, just go for hours and hours in tongues. I would rather speak with my understanding, with words you understand, so you can benefit from it. So I'm going to pray much in private and bring the fruit of that praying to the gathering and bless you with the byproduct of it. Does, uh, is that making sense? Paul did not say, as I have heard it and read it for years, heard it and read it for years, Paul was against speaking with tongues. He did not say that. He didn't say he was against it. We read these things out of context, and even theologians will read it out of context. Paul did not say... I would rather speak five words in my language than 10,000 words in a tongue. You, you, you read that out of context. He said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, but in the gathering, in the meeting, I would rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in a known tongue. Here's a powerful revelation. When you pray 10,000 words in an unknown tongue in private, you only need five words in your understanding to get the job done. You intensify what you do publicly, what you do with your family, what you do with your kids. Praise God. And it's not just for church services. The Holy Spirit is for every part 
uh, of your life. Now, I'm going to stop right there because then we get into some other things um, uh, about flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, flowing in your prayer language. So we're running out of time tonight. I do want to go to one more passage and uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Are you all still hanging with me? Thank you, Jesus. Father, just help us to get this. Help me to communicate it right. Help us to get a hold of it and flow with it and uh, manifest this the way you want us to. We just thank you, Father, for the Spirit-filled life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Acts 19.1. Acts 19.1. Um, praise God. We're going to pray uh, for Marcus here in a minute. Uh, Marcus recommitted his life. I hope I'm not embarrassing. He recommitted his life to the Lord, really knows that he knows that he knows he's born again this week. And, uh, and I mentioned to him, you know, about being filled with the Spirit. He says, I, I'm totally ready to do that. So we wanna, we're going to pray with him. After a while, he's going to receive the Holy Ghost here in a minute or two. Praise God. So I want to kind of just talk about that just for a second, okay? We've seen hundreds of people filled with the Spirit. And, uh, man, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad that uh, you all don't have to receive the Holy Ghost the way I did. I had no one to help me. I had to read books about it. You know, I had to read a book by an Episcopalian priest by the name of Dennis Bennett who started the charismatic revival among Episcopalians and Lutherans. And, and I read his book, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, he got filled with the Holy Spirit and got dismissed from his church as an Episcopalian because they didn't believe in all that. But, but his experience spread all over the world back in the 60s, all over the world. And uh, uh, I don't know if you know this, but Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, the Catholic University uh, in the 60s, the Holy Spirit just infiltrated that university. And students for the priesthood and priests and cardinals were all by the tens of thousands on the Duquesne campus, Catholic campus, Catholics being filled with the Spirit, speaking with tongues, ministering healing and flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. That same revival spread up to Notre Dame. And back in the 60s, bishops and cardinals and, uh, and priests and professors and students, by the tens of thousands, the Holy Spirit swept across the Notre Dame campus and tens of thousands of Catholics were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it ended up sweeping through all of America and around the world to where hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Catholics, were baptized with the Holy Spirit, spoke with tongues back in the 60s and 70s. That happened to the Lutherans. That happened to the Episcopalians. That happened among the Methodists and the Baptists. I was a non-denominational person, and it happened to me. And thank God for it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, so some of the things that I didn't know I want to share. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Are you there? And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Apollos was a, a preacher. That Paul, having passed through the upper regions came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they, so they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And here's the, here's the point I want to make about um, verse 2. Because one of the things that fought me for eight months to a year is all these theologians and my pastor and other well-meaning people said to me, you got all the Holy Spirit you're going to get when you got saved. You don't need it. There's this, this whole thing about there's another uh, uh, infilling or something. It's not scriptural. You get all the Holy Ghost you're going to get when you got saved. Well, then I came across this verse. And the Paul asked these disciples, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? If it was automatic, he wouldn't have asked the question. Now, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit does come into you and recreate your spirit. But he doesn't fill you. You're not filled. The baptism in the Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is different and subsequent to salvation. And it requires you receiving him. You receive Jesus, you're ready for heaven. But you need to receive the Holy Spirit because that makes you ready to minister and be a supernatural witness on earth. We need to not just be born again. We also need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you listening to me? If it was automatic, Paul wouldn't have asked that. Do you all see that? Amen. Amen. And so they said, well, we don't, Holy Spirit, what in the world are you talking about? Uh, the Holy who? And he said to them, and, well, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. That's John the Baptist that came before Jesus ever showed up on the scene. So then Paul said, 
Well, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. That's the, that was a Jewish baptism before Jesus came. That's not for Christians. But he did it saying to the people that they should believe on him whom the, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What, what, what does that mean? What happened here is Paul got them born again and water baptized them. Would you agree with that? Would you agree by the end of verse 5, when they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, how many by lifted hand would agree they're now saved? Born again, right? But notice that wasn't all they needed. Notice verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. That's not the new birth. That's him coming upon. The Holy Spirit came upon them and... They spoke with tongues and prophesied. There's the evidence. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, that's the pattern for the New Testament. Get saved, be filled. Get saved, be filled. Notice Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. There's five accounts in the book of Acts. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. This is Philip preaching, verse 4. There went, there, there, for those who were scattered, went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord gave, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. You might want to circle the word sorcery. The Greek word behind that is pharmacy. He was using drugs to alter people's state of mind. Verse 10, to whom they all gave heed to this sorcerer from the least to the greatest, saying that this Simon the sorcerer is the, this man's the great power of God. So this this sorcerer had them believing he was the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But, but. So this sorcerer basically had them all under his spell. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So they believed and were baptized. How many of you would agree by the end of verse 12 Many of these Samaritans, these people he's talking about, were already saved. Do you agree with that? Saved, right? But notice that's not all. Now notice Simon. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So notice in verse 13, Simon also believed and was baptized. Did you see that? He's saved. Now, in most churches in America, that's it. You go to a membership class, you get your membership certificate, you join the church, you, become, you volunteer somewhere, and you've got everything there is to get. That You're, you're saved. You're, praise God, you're saved. Thank you. Good, good job, brother. But notice the pattern in the book of Acts. Is there something else? Notice verse 14. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Would you all agree that Jesus is the word of God? So they'd received Jesus, right? Well, when they heard about that, they sent Peter and John to them. Now, they, they lived in Jerusalem, about 40 miles from Samaria. So they, they let Peter and John know, we got a bunch of new converts down here in Samaria. Now, why did they send for Peter and John? Who, verse 15, when they had come down, prayed for them, them new converts, okay? What did they pray? That they might receive the Holy Spirit. So they were born again, but they sent Peter and John there to make sure that they got filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a priority that they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Every church should follow this pattern. We're glad you're born again. Thank God you're saved. Thank God you're a new creation. But, but wait, don't, we, we need to get you filled with the Holy Spirit to give you the power to be what you need to be. We do an injustice to believers to leave them saved without power. Because that's not, that's not how the Bible works. Now, what happened? This is it. Isn't this interesting? Now, I want you to see something else about verse 15. It did not say, Who, when they had come down, prayed for them, that God might somehow give them the Holy Spirit. 
He said they prayed that they might receive. The Holy Spirit's already been given. But it's up to us to help people receive what's already been. It's up to us to receive what's already been given. Right? Because I've dealt with people down through the past four decades. Well, if God wants me to have the Holy Spirit and all that, you know, he'll give it to me. No. No, he's already given the Holy Spirit. He's waiting for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, notice this. Verse 16. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. That's another phrase for being filled. They had only been baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. Now I've never seen this till tonight. This is revelation. Notice their uh, notice their view of American Christianity. Oh, they've only been water baptized. Bless their hearts. Notice what they said. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, implying that's not all there is. Oh, they've only been, they're saved, good, we're glad they're saved, but they've only been baptized in the name, but they haven't been filled with the Spirit. And what we can say about a lot of people in America right now is they've only been baptized in the name of Jesus, they're saved, but they're powerless. You follow what, I'm not judging, you follow the the viewpoint here? Now notice what happened. Uh, And, verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter rebuked him and said, You need to get your heart right. You need to get your attitude right. It's not for sale. He wasn't wasn't asking to pay for the Holy Spirit. He wanted to pay for the ability to lay hands on people so they would be filled, so he could control the people like a sorcerer. All right, he's going to try to use the Holy Spirit and use that to make money. All right, he just had some attitudes he needed. And Peter said, you better get your heart right, dude. All right, so here's the thing. It doesn't say they spoke with tongues there, but it did say that Simon saw, through the laying on of hands, he saw something. He did not just see them standing there. He saw some kind of of a physical manifestation that so amazed him that he wanted to pay for the ability to do that to other people. Amen. So there is some type... And, and so what did he see? He saw them speaking with tongues and, and, and speaking in a supernatural language that absolutely floored him. He said, man, this is powerful. So praise God. We're not going to go to the other examples, but we can see in Acts chapter 19 that it's, there's, there's something beyond salvation. It's receiving the Holy Spirit. They spoke with tongues and prophesied when they were filled. Paul laid hands on them. Here the uh, James and John came after they were saved and baptized. And they laid hands on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. That's the pattern for it. So what happens is, you know, uh, you don't have to have hands laid on you. There's people that have received the Holy Spirit while they're worshiping in here. They'll come up to me and say, "Uh, I'm talking this strange language. Is that tongues? I said, well, let me hear it. And they'll start speaking with tongues. And I said, when did you receive that? Well, while we were singing that song, I just started singing in, in, in a foreign language, right? And it's amazing. It's not hard at all. Uh, if your heart is open, your heart is open to the Lord, and you're willing to take a simple step of faith, receiving the Holy Spirit is the easy, easiest thing we can do. So we want to thank you on YouTube. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to call 606 759 7211 here at Victory Christian Center. You call and get a hold of our secretary, or you call and leave a message, and we'll have somebody call you back because you don't want to live another day without being filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't want to live another day without being saved and water baptized. But don't just stop there. Don't only be water baptized. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and become a supernatural blessing to people around you. So, Father, I pray right now, that someone who's watching this YouTube recording, it may be five years from now, it may be ten years from now, it may be next week, I, I'm saying to you right now, God wants you filled with the Holy Ghost. He wants you praying in tongues. He wants you flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And the plan is to be born again, water baptized, and filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with tongues and becoming a major supernatural blessing 
to, uh, to people in your life. So, Father, I pray right now for people that are listening to YouTube. Right now, in Jesus' name, I command you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I command the Holy Spirit to come on you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for that mighty language of the Spirit to come up out of your belly right now. Come on, now give utterance to that. You that are watching on you, give utterance to it right now. I'm going to begin to pray in the Spirit. You join me. Come on, yield to that. Give, give voice to it. Hallelujah. Hey, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you receive the Holy Spirit tonight through YouTube, I want you to tell someone, I received the Holy Ghost. I want you to find someone. And if you don't know anybody, you call 606 759 7211, or you email us on victorymaysville.com, and we will send you some information to help you to feed on this. Amen. Don't let the devil or anybody else talk you out of it. That's a real language. It may not sound like mine, but it's a real language. And if you keep yielding to it, you're going to find yourself doing supernatural things for the power of God. Amen. <laughs>